Okay, so we just pointed out a couple different plants. We have Jalmea. Oops, Jalmea right here. We have a uh, pickle weed right here, Zalicornia. And we have this stuff right here, which is Desticlus. Desticlus spicata right here, Desticlus. Okay, so just a couple quick, uh, couple quick aspects of these plants and why that might matter for restoration or, or why you might want to think about it for maybe your restoration design or something. Uh, uh, and then after I explain that, you guys can walk by and I'll make sure everybody sees all these. There's many other species here. These are just a couple. The stickless. Uh, again, very wide ranging plant. One of the widest ranging plants in California. Uh, certainly that we have in our wetlands. So uh, that's not a weed. So a lot of the weeds here are all over the place. So the stickless. Have a look at how it's growing. So it is, um, it's very much a spreader, right? There's one of these, one of these stems kind of goes, and then these these guys tuft off of here, and then this is gonna tuft and tuft and tuft. So it's very rhizominous. A rhizome is, is kind of like a stem, but it goes along the ground basically, right? So very rhizominous, asexually dominating. So a little bit of a plant can get in here, and then it zoop, spreads out. Same with Jaumea. A little bit of a plant gets in there, a little bit of a plant colonizes the site. And then all of a sudden the runners or the stems or whatever, zoop, spread out. Jamea, pickleweed, a lot of these plants are this way. So because salt marshes are sort of a little bit betwixt between, one of the adaptations seems to be with a lot of these plants, they might be hard to get there with seeds, but once they get there, they somatically grow. They, they asexually reproduce, they expand physically. And therefore a lot of our salt marsh plants tend to be the kind of plants that have a lot of runners, that have a lot of rhizomes, that have a lot of spreading tissues to them. So one dude gets in and they go crazy. Uh, okay, so there we go. So the other thing you can notice as you look at some of these plants is they have different adaptations to deal with a stressful environment. <clears throat> Desticlus spicata, which may or may not be able to be seen too easy today, but if I rub my fingers on it, it, start, it feels gritty. That grit is salt. So this individual deals with salty water, salty environment by physiologically excreting salt, okay? So, so it throws it outside of its body. And so in effect, it's not, it doesn't have a salty environment. It's got a regular, you know, freshwater internal plant environment. Salicornia, check out Salicornia. Now don't do this. Don't do this, don't break plants, you guys. That's right. But um, have, so normally the, the, the tissues here are green. So this is, it has a, a, a woody stem. So it has a, 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 you know, kind of feels like a twig stem. And then the, and essentially the leaves are essentially these green soft tissues, succulent tissues that, that, that spread up. It's in this series of kind of like a caterpillar or, or, or uh, what do I call it? Like Lego block kind of units. But then at the tips, have a look, the tips look kind of red. So what it can do is it'll take salt and it'll sequester salt into certain parts of its body, like these tips. And then when the salt gets to be a certain, so, so it's, it's physiologically isolating the salt, just like the stickless is, but it's doing it uh, for the most part internally, okay? And then once there gets to be so much salt in here, it just kind of goes, F it, I'm gonna die. And so this starts to turn red and becomes and starts to senesce and eventually will just fall off, right? So it sort of throws off salt that way. These different plants have different adaptations to deal with these stressful things. Okay, so go ahead, keep walking. I'm just gonna point out as people walk by here. Okay, so the question was, uh, are there gobies here right now? And yes, the answer is there are gobies and fish here. One of the issues that we have though, when we have a catastrophic fit or, or a, a, a instantaneous breach of the lagoon, what can happen in a flat area like this, uh, the water can go out so quick, there can be fish back here, and then all of a sudden, and they're, you know, so they're in like two feet of water, three feet of water, and they're like, woo, that's good, man. And then the berm breaches, and all of a sudden, over the course of a couple hours, it goes from three feet underwater to, to you know, an inch or two underwater, and that's where they can get totally predated upon by the seagulls, by anything. So that's a huge problem, or, or can be a huge problem. This water here is still, even though it's, it's, it's breached and it's low, 
this is still enough of a refuge for, for fish, right? Um, so that, that's actually one of the things that we have, a, have had a, historically a problem with with the Santa Clara River mouth is it is much, much flatter and, and, there, and it goes for a much larger area and lots of fish get stranded when we breach. So, now, why would that be a problem? If it's nature, it's nature, I suppose, right? But with an endangered species, we're worried. Even, even the natural loss of some critters can be a problem. Uh, jump ahead to a little bit what I'm gonna say when I'm out there is this was historically manually breached. So there used to be a, a, a big bulldozer parked out here during much of the year. And whenever the water quality would, would get to a certain level, it would trigger a health concern. There were fecal indicator bacteria levels here that were problematic. Fecal indicator bacteria, why? Again, those guys said it was tapia. But then when they cleaned up tapia, magically there were still issues with fecal indicator bacteria. I wonder why. Maybe the septic systems, right? So anyway, so because of that, because of the public health issues, when the water uh, quality would get to a certain level, the county would, would breach, manually breach the, the berm. So we're doing it much more often. So if, if nature pops a hole in the breach or pops a hole in the berm and some fish are stranded, that sucks, right? But if you decide you are gonna breach that and there's an endangered species, you're, you, gotta, you gotta make some more endangered species, right? You're gonna get hit for it. The other thing we've seen historically in places like here, especially places like here, surfers would intentionally pop it when they would want a good... So uh, some people have been known to, to surf a standing, a standing wave that would set up. So, so if you have a bunch of water here and we pop that for at least a couple hours, the, it's, it's like a wave, but it's, it's in one place, right? So you can sort of do that. Um, and so there's, there's, there's historically been some issues with, with uh, people not authorized popping holes in some of these berms for various reasons. So if it's something like that, if it's the county doing it, if it's some person trying to make a video for TikTok or whatever the hell, right? Then they could be held liable for the, if they killed some endangered species. But, but normally that, that wouldn't be an issue. But yes, the answer is there's a lot of foraging that's going on here. There's, these birds are eating invertebrates. These birds are eating uh, fish. These birds are eating all kinds, of, uh, all kinds of stuff. Okay, so Nathan's question here is about the irrigation. So if we look at, uh, if we look, uh, let's see, like right, right here, there's a sprinkler head right here. Um, right there by the walkway, there's another sprinkler head. And so Nathan was saying like, what's up with that? So what's up with that is um, when we first do the planting, again, we said before, our, our uh, salt marsh vegetation can deal with fresh water. They actually grow better in fresh water. Our upland vegetation obviously grows better and needs fresh water. You can't handle any salt water. So when we first plant these areas, the first thing we'll do is water it, right? And so and yeah, that, might, that might be a five gallon bucket. You might just sort of dump water the day you're planting. But initially these roots are all screwed up, right? They're all naked and they're not established. They're not into the soil and stuff. So usually we will irrigate the system to start with. Now that could be irrigation for a few days. That could be irrigation for a few weeks. More typically in our dry, hot Southern California environment, especially where this year, right? hottest temperature ever recorded in, Ma, in, in, in since we started keeping records in LA County, 100, was that in 20 or 121? 121, 121 right? The technical term for that is effing hot, right? <laughs> and so, so uh, even though these plants you know, have evolved in places where it's sometimes hot, we're getting into hotter and drier conditions. So even if we didn't historically feel like we needed to irrigate, more and more restorations we're having to irrigate to at least get the plants established. What does that mean? Does that mean one year? Does that mean six weeks? Does that mean three years? It's gonna vary on the site. Uh, I, yeah, so, so okay, so we, we do that. So we, we put some irrigation in here and then usually on a timer type deal. So we water it in the, not usually all year, but like the dry times of the year, right? So, okay, water, water, water. Uh, and then at some point when the plants are established, if you did your design right, you should be able to start weaning them off. So maybe the first year you're watering a couple times a week, 
maybe the second year you're only watering during the like driest months and you're watering like one day a week or something like that. And then, you know, like that. Um, uh, I do know of a situation where when I was younger and we were starting up restorations, this one project was done and the folks screwed up the elevation. I can't emphasize this enough. The elevation, if we're off by an inch or two high or low, that can kill the project. It doesn't seem like it here because we're up right now, we're up on this high walkway and we see plants from here all the way down to over there. So, so it may not seem like it here, but, but elevation critical, 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 critical. And so these guys did this project and they screwed up and they made the elevation about a foot or so too high. Okay. They planned their salt marsh plants. They put in their irrigation just like, like here and they're watering. They came up to their, the end of their monitoring period or whatever, I forget what it was, two years or something like that, two or three years in that project, came up and they're like, okay, it was mitigation. The developer had put in a bunch of houses, destroyed some wetlands. So this was required mitigation for the wetlands he destroyed. So they, they finished the final monitoring, they've met all their, their percent cover and all, that, all, their, all their assessment targets, all good to go. And they signed off with the agency and they said, okay, this is functionally a wetland now, great finished up the next month the developer gets a bill from the consulting firm and the, the developer says what the f is this and the consultant said well this is the monthly water bill and he goes no 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 we're done i just signed i legally covered my butt's covered and they said oh well, yeah but we have to do this the guy said no 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 you signed off the agency said it's good so i'm done i'm not paying for that so we turned off the tap and within six months all the plants are dead right so um so that just speaks to the the issues there's a couple things that speaks to. One, we have to get the design right first and foremost, no question. Secondly, when we have errors like that and we're designing a restoration or doing a restoration, what does that do? That, that signals to the developer that this was all BS, right? That we didn't really care about making more wetlands. This was just a tax on them, right? And I can't underestimate the importance of this kind of rhetoric. It's been incredibly harmful to our environmental protection. So he says, look, if you really, if you really cared about making, and I think this is a rational argument, right? If you really cared about making more wetlands, you wouldn't have called that thing a functionally equivalent wetland, but you just signed off on it. You said, I'm good. You said, we're good. And so, so therefore um, I shouldn't have to pay anything else. Right. And this is all just some elaborate thing. So uh, we want to make sure that we design it correctly but we also wanna make sure that we're really clear with our communities, communities that we're working with, both communities that support us and communities that are maybe antagonistic towards restoration, that, you know, uh, that we're trying to go forward here. And so, so this shouldn't be like an us versus them thing. It should be, let's get, the, make sure this is working for everybody, right? If the developer says, I shouldn't have to pay for watering for 50 years, that seems to be a reasonable thing to me, right? If that, if that constraint is. So we should make sure that we pull that into our design and don't have those kind of surprise things uh, at the end. Because that, that harms everybody. It harms the environment, harms support for the idea, harms functioning, all that kind of stuff. Cool? So that's what these are. So, the, so, so these are the remnant parts of the irrigation. We could have, at the end of this, we could have come in and ripped those irrigation pipes out. So maybe it would look maybe a little bit better aesthetically. But the ripping out would cost money, cost time. It would also disturb the soil. So what you'll see is when people definitely are planning a short-term install, they'll usually lay the pipe on the surface and do it in a way that's relatively easy to pull out. These were put in for a much longer period of irrigation, and so they're harder to remove. Is that cool? Any other questions about that? All right, let's keep walking.